Hey there, just waiting to see who joins us here in this Facebook Live video. The app says it's building an audience for me. There's someone, there's a viewer. Three viewers, yikes. We are blowing up. For the three or four people joining, I have this little lapel mic on. Would you uh, type in whether or not you can hear me clearly? <laughs> Sorry, Sherry. Next time I'll probably run a live video just off of my Migraine Guy page. Got a thumbs up and a yes from Sherry. Hi, Darcy, LaPixi. All right. Great, Terry. Glad everyone can hear me okay. This is a fairly inexpensive lapel mic. I'm also cheap, so it's good to know that it's working decently. So, uh, looks like people are pouring in by the singles. Uh, so this is in conjunction with the Migraine Support uh, Facebook page. They uh, do a lot of things. They post a lot of inspirational uh, pictures and content. Uh, they pair with a lot of migraine study companies, places that want to conduct studies on medications and whatnot. Um, but additionally, uh, they asked me to mention that they are also running, I think it's actually on like at the very top of their Facebook page, uh, a $200 Amazon gift card giveaway. So make sure to check out the details of that. I think it's something like post pictures of your prescriptions or something and you uh, are entered. So there's that. What's up, Michael? What's up, Michael? I got my laptop right here trying to make sure that I don't miss any comments as they come in. Just waiting a bit while we uh, officially launch the Facebook Live. See how many people join. Anne, bonjour to you too. I I think that's one of the 20 words in French that I know, so thank you for thank you for doing that for me. So I don't quite know uh, what to do on a Facebook Live video other than it gives me the chance to not just make a video uh, or a podcast where I talk at you, but that you can type uh, responses or questions, and uh, if I'm at all uh, knowledgeable on the topic you're asking about, I can reply. Uh, so that's kind of the basic idea. Uh, hey Heather, hello from Georgia. I am from uh, Nebraska, so we're a little far away, but not too far. A little difficult getting in, Michael says. Yeah, I, I've, <laughs> I've never actually participated in viewing a Facebook Live video. This is only the second one where I've actually been the person doing the video part. So uh, I'm not entirely sure what's involved, so I am sorry if it has been a little difficult. Oh, we got a first question here from Christy. Do you get vertigo as a type of migraine? Uh, what I assume you are asking is whether or not I get vertigo uh, during a migraine or as like a symptom, uh, either in the, the post-drome or prodrome phase. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what constitutes vertigo. I've never been clinically diagnosed with vertigo. What I do know though is that when I uh, start to get a pretty intense migraine, I, uh, I do get pretty dizzy. Uh, and actually the dizziness was, was horribly exacerbated with uh, the three or five different triptans that I tried as an abortive medication. Um, yeah, symptom, room spinning. Yeah, I, I certainly get very, very dizzy. Um, I don't know if it's vertigo because the, the few cases of vertigo that I've actually read descriptions of sounded way more intense than anything I had experienced. Um, but it certainly, I certainly do get dizzy and many of the migraine medications I had tried, uh, both abortives and prophylactics, certainly uh, exacerbated that and made it to the point where I wouldn't feel safe driving um, after taking some of the medications. Um, let's see. How about you, Christy? Do you do you get pretty intense uh, vertigo or dizziness with your migraines, and how frequently do you get it, uh, both the vertigo as well as the uh, uh, your migraines? 
let's see, Michael is complimenting my review of Lipixi uh, Wellness's essential oil products. And uh, it's, it is very nice that, that the Lipixi creator did offer us a bunch of discounts, both off their website and Amazon. If you uh, don't know who I am, why uh, the Migraine Support web page, now that we've got about 30 people watching, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name's Kevin. I run the Migraine Guy uh, YouTube channel, uh, the Migraine Guy podcast now, and the HeadacheReview.com. Um, and I'm not at all a you know physician. I don't have medical training. Uh, what I am is a migraine sufferer who noticed that when he would go on websites like YouTube, uh, that there was some migraine content, some informative and helpful uh, videos there. But overall, if I had a specific question about a specific product, a specific medication, a specific supplement, uh, the, the content on YouTube was lacking. And so what I did uh, was I just started making some, some really poor quality YouTube videos. I was, just, um, I was just using the webcam in my little Chromebook, which was pretty uh, poor. Uh, the pixelation is pretty horrible. And I just was doing videos about my prescriptions and my reactions with them. Uh, most of the videos there are under five minutes because the webcam software I was using only allowed five minute re uh, recordings. Uh, so that's why they're kind of poor. And I'm also using the, the microphone embedded in my laptop's uh, webcam. And so it's all pretty low quality. Uh, although the content is pretty decent. I don't know. It's pretty decent. Uh, but what eventually I did, you know, started uh, upgrading the hardware that I was using, the software I was using to, to make better quality videos after I started noticing that there was actually a need for people to be able to uh, just go on YouTube and check out. Sorry, some of the comments are coming uh, kind of machine gun pace, so I'm having trouble keep... Oh, you know what I could do? I could load up the... Uh, live stream on my laptop and that'll keep a running tally of all the comments and then I can just watch that. So I don't want to miss anyone's uh, comments. That's the main reason. But so that's that's why I have been approached by migraine support and some other places to talk about certain things. Not at all because I'm a researcher. I'm not a, an authority. Uh, I'm not any sort of uh, clinician or physician. Uh, but what I am is someone who likes to make uh, informative videos and informative podcasts for the migraine community uh, that piggybacks on the work of others in a way that makes it somewhat uh, understandable for normal uh, people because I am very, very normal, very, very average. So let's see here. Peggy has a comment. A thousand milligrams of primrose oil in the morning has helped her, but after four weeks, the primrose caused severe anxiety. Wow. I was told the oil reduces inflammation and balances hormones looking for another. Interesting, a thousand milligrams of primrose oil. I don't, how many like drops does that translate to? Let's see, she gives us a response here. Well, while we wait for that response, what else can I say about myself? Yeah, if you uh, you know follow anything on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or anything like that, all you gotta do is search the migraine guy, the migraine guy, and you will find me. Uh, I am the migraine guy and all of those sources, Instagram and whatnot. So you can check me out there if you want. Uh, some of the uh, different social medias make certain kinds of content more conducive to those uh, social media contexts. And so Twitter's good for, you know, quick articles, uh, rapid things to read, maybe a couple pictures. Um, let's see here. Margie uh, Byers, Bayers, uh, tell me what's good to take outside of sleep. Interesting question. Uh, you want me to just tell you? Um, that's right, and let's see, outside of sleeping, a lot of the uh, research does support uh, a bunch of different supplements, if that's what you're asking about, besides medications, what kind of supplements. Tracy, I'll get to your question about migraine sunglasses in a moment. Um, so 
random supplementation is is very well uh, researched in some ways, but not well researched in other ways. Part of the problem is that in the United States, for example, the FDA doesn't regulate supplements, their claims, etc. And so you could have two companies, let's get my fingers right, you could have two companies selling, you know, magnesium, let's say it says 250 milligram pills, and one of them could contain 250 milligrams of magnesium, and the other one could just contain 10 milligrams of magnesium, and maybe just a bunch of dextrose or cellulose or something like that, some sort of filler material, maybe even just rice flour. And so that makes it pretty difficult to uh, translate what research says uh, is a good supplement for migraine sufferers to take like magnesium, B vitamins, uh, those kind of things, and actually being able to get it at the store. So you have to do a lot of research, uh, not just about what supplements to look for, but what supplement companies are good places to purchase from, what companies are doing good work. Uh, so I, I don't quite have an answer for you because even if I said magnesium, B vitamins, X, Y, and Z, you still have to be able to find them. And I'm, I'm personally on kind of a mission to try and isolate the good supplement companies from the bad ones because this is actually uh, a pretty substantial issue. Uh, something like Feverfew, for example, uh, and a couple others have been pulled from uh, large authoritative bodies as being recommended because uh, those supplements can contain uh, uh, other compounds in them which when ingested on a daily basis can build up and be toxic for humans and so uh, like the American Academy of Neurology, the American Headache Association ha or a, a society has pulled their supplement guide because they recognized that migraine sufferers were taking them and noticing adverse uh, effects because the supplements aren't regulated. So it is a bit of a crapshoot right now, at least in the United States. Let's see here. Oh, there was a there was a comment about migraine sunglasses. I need to um, look at. So if I miss your comment or your question, you really want me to respond to it. Feel free to just copy and paste it again, and I will definitely try to get to it. So migraine sunglasses or migraine relief glasses, as they're probably more accurately called, I think are fantastic. Um, there's a few companies. Where did I? I had a pair in here, I can't find where they're at now. Uh, there are a few companies that make them and market pretty heavily. Uh, the two you've probably seen uh, on sponsored posts are uh, Axon Optics and Therispec. They are the two big companies. Um, and they make a lot of good products. Don't get me wrong, they use uh, the kind of glass that you need in order to filter out the blue wavelength of light, FL41 glass, uh, which is you know the kind of glass that research does have uh, some support for. The problem with uh, companies like Axon and Therispec is that like the baseline price for their products is $99, and then it shoots up from there all the way into the couple hundred dollar mark. And that puts it kind of on the heavy end, the, the heavy end, the expensive end uh, of the spectrum for a lot of headache and migraine sufferers, especially since it's not impossible, but you probably aren't gonna be able to get your insurance company to cover the entire cost. The nice part about some other companies is that while their designs aren't uh, as fashionable, uh, didn't get the air quotes, fashionable, uh, they do offer the glass and the, uh, uh, the frames for a much lower price point. So my personal favorite right now is Somni Light, uh, and you can actually get 20% off of their $40 migraine sunglasses just by using the product or the discount code Migraine Guy, all one word. Uh, so that knocks the price down into $30. So you get three pairs of Somni Light for one pair of Axon or Therispec, which is just a crazy good uh, deal in my opinion. Uh, and I don't get like an affiliate deal. I'm not getting kickbacks from that. They just wanted to uh, give my viewers uh, a discount. So I, I really like them for that. There is another company uh, that is going to be sending me a couple review items, and I think it's Mellow Migraine, that's it. And uh, they currently have one pair of glasses that has uh, a green tint to it. Now, I don't know much about their product, I don't know about the glass that they use. Uh, they were going to send me a review item, but they said, we're gonna hold off because we have a bunch of new designs coming in and we'll send you a couple of those. That way you can talk about our newest product. So when I get those, make sure to check out the review on YouTube and probably a, an adjacent um, review on Migraine again. Uh, I'm 
like in the middle of the process of becoming a Migraine Again contributor. If you don't know Migraine Again, it's just migraineagain.com. They have a ton of articles, a ton of reviews, and they uh, have asked me to be their video reviewer. So as soon as the uh, Migraine World Summit is over next week, they're gonna be putting up my review video of ice-based therapy products, ranging from the Migra Cap, the Headache Hat, the Migraine Hat, and the Ice Cap and the ice down migraine wrap. Uh, it's gonna be about a 20 minute video kind of comparing and contrasting those products. Uh, and then I'll probably do one on migraine relief glasses and sky's the limit basically. So that's uh, my little blurb on migraine relief glasses. They work really well. Uh, the big thing to worry about is that you don't wear them every single day, every single day, every single hour, uh, because you can get desensitized to normal light, which could actually trigger a worse migraine or headache for you because you're not used to normal light. And so when you're exposed to it, it could actually be more detrimental. So you have to be pretty selective about when you use your migraine relief glasses. Um, so there's that. Let's see, did I miss anybody's question or anybody who wanted to uh, make fun of me or anything? Let's see here. Let's see. Peggy Boppel says uh, she used fish oil by Nordic Naturals and made her migraines worse. That's terrible. Uh, Tracy's asking Somni Light. Yep, that is the company, just somnilight.com. If you go to my Facebook page, The Migraine Guy, uh, in the offers section in the bottom left, it actually has the coupon codes there for you to uh, copy and paste. So try to make it pretty easy. LaPixie is asking, when did I start getting migraines? Well, Let's see, sorry, I'm getting bogged down in the comments. When did I start getting migraines? I started getting migraines about 10 years ago, but they were extremely infrequent, roughly like once every six months. I do remember the first couple I had because they were so debilitating and I was caught off guard uh, to a very large degree because I had never really had a migraine. Everybody's had headaches, everybody's popped some aspirin or relief to get rid of them, and usually that works, maybe you chug some water but when I got my first migraine I was down for the count in a tremendous amount of pain but it was as I said once every six months and then in the last three years uh, out of nowhere uh, they just ratcheted up to uh, basically a couple times a week and then a few months later you know multiple times a week and a few months later at the chronic level where I was above 15 times a week or a month 15 times a month and it, they've just hovered there ever since. Today was actually a pretty good day. I got a decent amount of sleep yesterday and the night before. So that was pretty uh, nice because today I feel pretty decent. I had a mild uh, migraine, probably something in just like the one to two pain range, so very manageable. Um, but earlier in the week, especially over the week, this past weekend, I was just down for the count um, until uh, if you listen to the latest podcast, I did a little Colorado uh, road trip and found benefits from cannabis, uh, specifically little chewables, little edibles, given that smoking uh, actually has produced horrible migraines in me in the past. Um, so make sure to check out the podcast episode. Let's see here. Questions about Botox are so troubling because for some people, Botox works so well. Uh, maybe not the first or t uh, second time you've used it, but the, uh, you know, eventually people who get relief from Botox genuinely get serious relief from Botox. Um, but people who don't get relief from Botox don't seem to ever get relief from Botox. And you have to go multiple times. And it's very unlikely that insurance covers most, if not all, the cost. And so it's kind of a, kind of a crapshoot right now for headache and migraine sufferers. It's somewhat promising, but it's so expensive right now. Um, what else we got going on? Yes, lots of people talking about CBD oil and edibles. Yep, we definitely uh, at the Migraine Guy YouTube page and the podcast are going to be uh, extending the cannabis uh, discussion uh, to include CBD oil in the future. I do have a, a few companies that are willing to send me some review items. I don't quite know what the review items are. Uh, maybe a little tincture, uh, maybe a vaping device. I'm not entirely sure. 
um, but I will be doing reviews of those. Sarah Cairo is asking, can you explain more to people who don't understand how you can have a level one migraine? Most people think of migraine only in terms of the classic version. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, most of the pain scales that are worth their salt recognize that there's a spectrum of pain that migraine sufferers can be in. If you're a chronic pain sufferer of any kind, fibromyalgia, MS, anything like that, lupus, then you know that pain comes in degrees. So when you're a migraine sufferer, um, very often you can have some discomfort from your migraine. You can have some pain from your migraine. You can have some of your normal symptoms of migraine, but it's at a very small level. The classic migraine, the kind that I described having earlier, where you're debilitated, you're lying in a dark room, uh, maybe you're crying, maybe you're thinking about going to the ER, that's that far end of the spectrum, the seven, eight, nine, ten 10 level pain. Levels in the middle tend to be the kinds of pain that you do not find uh, pleasurable, but you can largely function throughout the day. And then pain on the small end of the scale is annoying. Uh, it does hurt, but it's the kind of pain that once you've had it for a few months, you actually become able to manage it. Uh, you, you can actually be in pain that six months ago may have been a five or a six, but today is a one or a two. And that might be uh, weird if you're not used to being in pain every day or close to every day. Um, but there, there's actually some studies out there that have shown that the more pain you're in frequently, the more frequent your pain, the better you are to handle it over the long term versus getting infrequent pain makes you less able to handle it because you're just not used to that much pain. Uh, Michael Martin said, tell them about the scale we use. So we have a, uh, not exclusive, but a pretty selective migraine support group. Um, and in the group, we have a pinned post, of course, the Migraine Guy support group. Um, and in the pinned post, we use a uh, pretty, let's see, I'm pulling it up right now. We use a pretty well detailed pain scale. Um, well, looks like this is gonna start freezing over here. Uh, I'll wait for it to pull up, but basically you've got a scale, there we go, where on the low end, uh, at the zero level, right, you've got pain-free. Great day, the way most people walk through life, things are great, there's rainbows and unicorns and life's so happy. On the far end, you have unspeakable. That's gonna be level 10. It's the kind of pain where uh, you just, you, you're just, you're, I don't know exactly how to describe it, but it's like you're consumed by the pain. All you can think about is pain, all you can feel is pain, all you can try to muster out is maybe a guttural, Ugh, because you're in so much pain. You're probably crying, uh, you're probably pleading with whatever God you believe in to <laughs> take the pain away, you're willing to sacrifice your neighbor's dog, whatever the case. So those are the two polar ends, and then everything in the middle is just a version of that to a greater or lesser degree. And so uh, if you're not familiar with someone saying that they're on like a level one or two pain, uh, one that doesn't mean that it's not true. And two, it probably means that you are not familiar with pain scales. And uh, if you want to be sensitive and understanding to someone who is in chronic pain, you need to get familiar with a pain scale. Most, phys most physicians are very familiar with the pain scale, although the particular pain scale that they use might actually be problematic, but that's kind of a meta medical uh, issue. The pain scale we have at the Migraine Guy Support Group is pretty detailed. It gives you a good way of gauging your pain uh, and assigning a number to it. That way you can properly uh, describe to others where you're at. And so pain scale is very important and having a good pain scale is even more important. So we have a pretty good one at the Migraine Guy uh, Support Group, better than most of the pain scales I've seen out there, especially ones that doctors actually use. So. Take that, doctors. Let's see here. Uh, any other topics we should talk about? I can just blab for hours. I'm sure you, I'm sure you all know that. Um, what else? So let's see. 
Yeah, and the latest podcast, the the first podcast that I just launched, which today, of course, is 420, so it makes sense that my first uh, full podcast was about cannabis. And you'll notice, Sarah Cairo, that I'm calling it cannabis and not marijuana, per your critique. Um, so yeah, the, the idea... Oh, here we go. Michael Martin's got a topic for us. Maybe you should go over rules of being accepted. Oh, nope. Scrolling too fast. Maybe you should go over rules of being acceptance of everyone's condition. If you disagree with a post, a compassionate question is much better than a dismissal of someone's issues. Absolutely. So one of the benefits of having a migraine support group that's private versus public means that we can set certain rules and certain conduct that we consider to be uh, kind of best. It's the best way to treat one another. And so in our group, since it's private, we do tend to get uh, a large amount of people. My phone is freaking out. There we go. We we tend to get a lot of people who do uh, uh, a lot of posting about their own personal issues. And those are the kind of things that a support group is really good with, right? You talk about what's bothering you, what's difficult in your life, how you're struggling with your relationships or work. But occasionally you get someone who wants to post something about the way that they particularly feel about a particular topic. And there are two basic ways to handle responses to that, right? One is to get into an internet flame war, start arguing with each other, telling the other person they don't know what they're talking about. And when you look at the public, migraine groups, a lot of them have those uh, threads. Now, they're not always negative. There's a lot of great people in them. I've been supported by a lot of great people there. But it does occur that you're going to get into these bickering fests. What we do at the Migraine Guys Support Group is that we have a pretty uh, pretty good way of handling disputes. We don't get a lot of disputes in the first place because we're somewhat selective about who we let in. But on top of that, when there are noticeable um, disagreements, me and the other mods uh, Sarah Cairo and Michael Martin. We usually talk about what's going on. If we think someone's genuinely to blame, uh, if they're not, how can we help resolve the issue? If they are to blame, how can we talk to them in a way that doesn't belittle them? Because the main idea is that this is a support group and people who get chronic migraine conditions, or sorry, chronic headache conditions like migraine need support. They don't need to be uh, slapped on the wrist or kicked out of a group. Moreover, comorbid conditions with migraine uh, can greatly affect people's behavior, right? Depression, anxiety, all that kind of stuff greatly affects people's personalities. And so they might have a really, really negative or really, really snarky post, but they could be going through a whole bunch of uh, electrochemical issues in their brain that is preventing them from being their normal self. And so in our group, we typically have a reply in a nice way policy first where if someone sa says something that sounds crappy we typically try to draw out their reasoning and if they continue to be crappy then that's fine then they're just going to be crappy and we can mute the thread maybe threaten to kick them out if they continue but typically it results in them having to explain their position more and it turns out that there's a lot more common ground uh, there and we can we can get along and we can have a disagreement but not burst into flames over it and that's really the goal I think of community, which is what our support group is. Let's see, we have a Dave piercing question, and Sarah's asking, do you have any theories as to why doctors don't agree on basic treatments meds? Even the neurologists are inconsistent, let alone regular GPs. No kidding. Okay, so let's see, the Dave piercing one I'll take first since it was first, but Dave piercing is pretty simple. Uh, there's not a lot of research on Dave piercing. The theory behind it, right, is that there's clusters of nerves that when you pierce you can uh, uh, interfere their, their firing with, and that's going to cascade probably into the trigeminal nerve and help prevent your overall migraines. There is an actual Dave piercing migraine support group on Facebook, and they did a, a survey actually, and it took about... Uh, I think a few months to fill out, but there was about 500 to 1,000 respondents. And it was, it was a pretty large amount of people in that group that said that the Dave piercing actually helped. Uh, as far as clinical research, there's not a ton behind it. Uh, it's a pretty inexpensive process, right? You go to wherever your ear piercing place is and have them puncture it. And uh, as long as you keep it clean, uh, the worst thing that would happen is that you just have to take it out and you lost your $20, so it's pretty low cost uh, possibility. But whether or not it's the cure or you know this large scale thing that's gonna help a lot of people, 
Uh, there's just not enough research to say that. And given that we know migraine is a complex neurological disease, the idea that one piercing, uh, a neurological genetic disease, the idea that one piercing is going to fix it is pretty silly. Uh, but if it does provide some relief, even for a short amount of time, I mean, the cost of a piercing seems like it would be worth it. Um, but of course, I don't have one, uh, just because I'm, I'm more skeptical than not. Um, that it's actually going to provide any long-term relief. And that's really the big thing, long-term relief. Uh, so it's kind of a 50-50 shot in my view, but if you're desperate enough, anything sounds good, so go for it. Uh, yeah, and McAllister's saying she has two piercings, but honestly, uh, thought it was just pain transfer. It didn't help her. Yeah, so let's get back to Sarah Cairo's question real quick. Uh, about why there's so much divergence in the medical community. Now, of course, I've seen, uh, you know, a half dozen GPs, a couple neurologists, and a headache specialist, and they all had wildly different things to say. But of course, that's just my small circle. Uh, sorry, I forgot to have the lapel. I just smacked it. Uh, that's my small circle. Uh, I can't generalize too far from that. But what I know from other headache and migraine sufferers and what I know from what other headache and migraine doctors write about is that there is this horrific disparity in medical professionals. Why is it like that? Well, for your general physician, right, they're, uh, I think the statistic is in their entire med school career, they get something like an hour out of one day to talk about migraine conditions. Maybe it's a full day for headache conditions in general. Uh, so they're not very knowledgeable to start with. Now, of course, as a general practitioner, uh, it makes a lot more sense to focus on things that most people are going to be coming in with. So sore throats, colds, uh, whatever, stuff like that, broken bones maybe. Um, so maybe not being specialized in migraine uh, makes some sense. But of course, given that there are literally hundreds of millions of us on the globe, it seems like they should have at least more training uh, insofar as their training should help them point us in the right direction. Uh, the first GP I went to for my, uh, uh, my migraines uh, literally pulled out his medication book and said, well, let's start with this. And then six weeks later went to the next one and said, well, let's go to this. And then six weeks later went to the next one and said, let's go to this. And that was his treatment plan. And then when he reached the bottom of the list, he said, well, it's time for a neurologist. And there's no way that that's like a reasonable uh, methodology for medical professionals, right? If I wanted uh, to just go down a list, there should just be a medication vending machine with all of the migraine medications and I'll just put my insurance card in and they can kick it out. And I don't need to waste time talking to a doctor, right? So that part was very annoying. Uh, what do you do then when uh, the, the neurologist maybe says something different than the headache specialist. Well, that is a big problem as well. Uh, you would wish that, you know, doctors that you're seeing could actually talk to each other. Uh, and I think that's one of the big reasons that there's a lot of disparities is that uh, your doctors or the doctors you go to over the years don't themselves typically communicate. Maybe they're in different provider networks. Maybe they've never heard of each other and maybe they don't, you know, respect the other person's opinion because of their experience and their schooling and this and that. Uh, there's probably a variety of just social factors that affect it. Um, but just, you know, in general, there's a, a host of so many problems between uh, getting com uh, medical professionals to communicate, even within the same building, right? How many times have you re-explained uh, your condition just to the same, uh, to, not to the same, but to maybe one or two nurses and then the doctor, and you're literally repeating verbatim what you told the first nurse, what you told the second nurse, and now what you're telling the doctor. And they're like not communicating amongst themselves. Uh, or maybe they're just trying to see if you're not lying? I don't quite know. Uh, but there is kind of a phrase that I've read the past few weeks. It's something like, not, uh, not all neuro, <laughs> wow, not all neurologists are migraine specialists and not all migraine specialists are neurologists. So in general, I think the basic uh, attitude towards most medical professionals when it comes to migraine recommendations is skepticism. Uh, and I'm a huge proponent of patient advocacy uh, and patients being informed, uh, not just because when patients are informed, they're more likely to see positive results, but because when you're an informed patient, there's a really, really good chance that if you've read five articles from the last five years about migraine, you're going to know as much, if not more, than the general practitioner or neurologist you're gonna go to. 
uh, and that can put you in a very good position to challenge what they tell you. Um, and you don't want to challenge them just because you're a rebel or a jerk, but you want to challenge them because you're there. They are getting paid six figures to tell you what to do to fix you. And if they don't know latest things about research, general features about migraines, why, why would you pay someone like that, right? I mean, I don't go to, let's say, Starbucks and, you know, they just pour some dirty mop water and microwave it and say, oh, I think this is coffee. I said, no, I know what coffee is. Give me coffee. Likewise, go to the doctor. I know what good medical uh, practice is. Give me good medical uh, practice. So uh, that was a long-winded, unsystematic reply to Sarah's comment. But it's pretty true. The disparities between the uh, medical professionals is pretty large and very, very upsetting. So... If you need a uh, migraine or headache doctor in your city or state, you can head over to theheadachereview.com. I have a, a list of doctors culled from the uh, Migraine Research Foundation uh, based on city and state, and they're headache and migraine professionals. So you can try to find one in your area. Not every city has one, um, but maybe a city close to you can... Uh, uh, you can find. So just head over to theheadachereview.com, type in your city uh, or state, and it'll populate a list of search results that you can check. Pamela, sorry, what was your name? Pamela Tavell Clark is asking how we get into the Migraine Guys uh, support group. Well, you can uh, request approval. Uh, we might chat with you a bit uh, to make sure that you're kind of on the same page with our core values. Uh, we might check your profile, make sure you're not a troll account. Um, uh, but so long as you meet those criteria, we'd happily accept anybody who needs genuine migraine support. But it's not an open group because we, we want to be somewhat selective to avoid the negative issues that large public groups have. Uh, and we've largely avoided those, or when they've cropped up, we've quickly uh, taken care of them. So that's, that's the benefit to having a private group. Uh, let's see here. Ashley says, please help me. Uh-oh. This is going to be a rough post. Please help me. I suffer from migraines three days straight sometimes. I automatically get them any time I don't sleep through the night or skip a meal. Uh, being a mom, I have no choice sometimes. I feel like... Where'd it go? I feel like a horrible mother when I am literally in a fetal position, unable to do anything. God. Ah. Uh. Here's an issue that I am woefully inequipped to talk about. Uh, hopefully on the podcast, I would like to interview some people in your position, Lindsay, specifically moms who uh, are moms. That's not to say that moms are the only ones that take care of the kids, but if you're a mom whose primary function is to take care of your kids, then I'm, I've heard a lot and a lot of people uh, asking for support and help on this and uh, being a guy who isn't a father, I really have nothing uh, to contribute on this issue. Um, but if you, you know, want to, man, my phone is freaking out. If you want to uh, request access to the support group, uh, we'd be happy to have you and you could reach out to some of the moms in the group for their answers because you're not alone. Uh, you're definitely not alone in feeling that way. Um, and parents in general who have migraines, not just moms, but parents, very often feel this way. They feel this horrible, you know, like ripping a part of themselves. On the one side, you want to do everything for your kids, but on the other side, you literally can't do anything, not even for yourself, let, al you know, let alone help them. So uh, definitely not alone. We should probably get uh, some of the uh, parents in the support group to do a live stream like this in the group. Uh, just to share their experience. Um, getting back to the support group, that really is the thing that I think makes a good support group a good support group, right? Is that you don't have to have all the answers. You certainly don't have to have all the answers. We were migraine sufferers. We don't have many answers at all. Um, but what we do have is each other. Uh, never being alone really is the secret I found to getting through chronic pain. And I've only had chronic pain for about three years. We have some people in the group who have suffered for 10, 30, 50, 60 years. Uh, and those people typically say the same thing. A strong support group and a good doctor are key to getting through. Um, so if you don't have a good doctor, at least have a good support group. Um, because being alone makes a lot of the other issues and symptoms with migraine much harder to bear. Um, 
But yeah, Lindsay, it looks like you're getting some good responses from people in the chat. So hopefully uh, that at least helps you know that you're not alone and maybe you could message some of those people and get some uh, recommendations about how they deal with the similar feelings that you're having. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, lots of lots of moms in here. There we go. That's right. Why am I talking? We should have we should have ladies doing this too. Uh, let's see. Any other topics to touch on? We've been going. Holy moly! Is it really been fifty minutes? Wow. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll go for maybe ten more minutes, uh, unless you guys just want to keep going. I you know I've got my Mountain Dew here. Sorry, uh, Michael Martin. This is a this is a Pepsi product. Getting back to support groups, uh, just isn't it kind of frustrating on Facebook that you can have a support group with a topic, but you can't have like subsections within your group, right? So we're the migraine guy support group, but why can't we have like a subsection for moms with migraines, a subsection for dads with migraines, a subsection for X with migraines? That way people within your group can't, oh, Michael does love Pepsi, fine. I thought you were a coat guy, Michael. Uh, that way people in your group can actually kind of specialize. I really wish that Facebook did that. Um, but they don't right now, so that's fine. Uh, moms with migraines. That would be a good group. That would be a good group. Ooh, LaPixie is asking, what life changes, what life changes have I had to do since getting migraines? Well... The biggest thing I've had to do is like, I, I yeah, uh, well, I'm gonna steal someone's metaphor. So as I'm sure we're uh, aware, there is this notion of being a spoonie uh, and it relates to being a chronic pain uh, sufferer. And a spoonie is basically someone who in the morning has a set of spoons. These are metaphorical spoons, of course, but they're your kind of things that you can commit to do during the day. So maybe getting out of bed and making breakfast for yourself and your spouse or your significant other is two spoons out of 10. So now you have eight spoons left for the day. And then maybe you need to go to work and that's gonna be seven of your eight spoons. So when you get home, you just have one spoon. What are you gonna use it on? Are you gonna uh, hang out with your family? Are you gonna try to read a book? Are you gonna try to maybe work out? Something like that. So the spoonie metaphor is there. So how has uh, being a migraine sufferer affected me? Well, it's basically taken my spoons from like infinite, right? I could just do whatever I wanted most of the time. And it's taken me down to where I am extremely selective about the commitments that I make. Uh, sorry about the video quality. The sun just went down or got a cloud in the sky. And so the, the sun is not uh, illuminating my face. Um, so basically, I've just I, I rarely commit to anything apart from really important functions um, because I hated having to cancel over and over and over. And part of canceling means that you kind of become, I don't want to say a vict, oh, oh, I thought someone was typing something about suicide and their feelings right now. It says, please speak on suicide when it comes to chronic migraine. Sure, will do, Lindsay, thank you. But my basic function uh, is or my basic uh, default position is never commit and then if I can do something go do it because I, I hated canceling on people and what makes it worse is that given that like pop culture uh, has a pretty weird conception of what a migraine is um, telling people that you can't do something because you have a migraine always does one of two things one they say okay and you kind of wonder are they mad at me why why are, you know, are they mad? Are they questioning my motives, etc.? The other side of the coin is that they might say, okay, no problem, and wonder why you're just not taking some aspirin to get over it. Uh, and so uh, given that there are those two kind of disparities in pop culture uh, about migraine, I uh, just stopped committing because I hated canceling and wondering if they were questioning my motives or if they just thought I was being a sissy with the migraines. Um, so that's the biggest way it's affected me. It's affected me in a variety of ways as it has for all of us, I'm sure. There's a lot of relationship tension uh, depending on what kind of relationships we're talking about, family, friends, coworkers, bosses, that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of things that it takes away from uh, being able to do certain activities, being able to uh, enjoy the same things that you enjoyed before, uh, all that kind of stuff um, that uh, certainly is in play for me, but it's probably in play for you as well. Um, 
So let's see, good question, LaPixie. Uh, let's see, the, the question about suicide is so difficult, right? Uh, because suicide, uh, I mean, we've all probably, we either probably know someone who committed suicide or we know someone who's been affected by someone committing suicide. Uh, and suicide is one of those horrible things, right? Like on the one hand, you have, uh, yep, that's right, Michael, many of us have lost friends. Uh, on the one hand, you have the uh, negative way that someone's suicide affects you, right? You're left with a whole host of questions. Why would they do that? Why wouldn't they tell me? I thought we were close. Uh, maybe I could have done something more. Maybe I wasn't sensitive enough to their needs. Uh, all of those big questions that are almost impossible to answer. Uh, but on the other hand, someone who takes their own life is either uh, mentally unstable to some degree or they're facing a really, really difficult situation where death seems like the best option. Uh, and as a chronic pain sufferer, uh, you could certainly understand how decades of pain could lead to the conclusion that death is the best option. And so I am not a licensed therapist or a psychiatrist or anything like that. I don't have any training on this. Uh, I do have you know, a friend who was suicidal who said that I was the reason that they didn't do anything dramatic that night. Um, but I, I don't have any formal training in this. And so if you're at all worried uh, one that you know a close loved one who has uh, a condition that makes them more susceptible to depression like migraine uh, is is a real worry for you then you should uh, get in contact with some suicide support groups find out what you can do uh, to help them but at the same time you can't put yourself in the position where you're the fixer right their life is their life and your life is your life and there's nothing you can do to control someone else's life sometimes and that's just that's just the crappy part of being a human, right? Sometimes you're just out of control. But as far as it relates to migraine sufferers, uh, getting chronic migraine does put you at a higher risk for getting depression. Uh, a lot of the medications that are given to help prevent and abort migraines, if you read the fine print, some of those say suicidal tendencies can be heightened. If you feel that way, contact in a, a, a professional right away and so you have to be very sensitive you you probably this is another reason why support uh, either online or with people close to you is important because you might not notice that your personality has changed either because of your chronic pain condition or because of the medication you're taking but people close to you can notice that and you need to if you have a chronic pain condition be willing to listen to them uh, it's very difficult to um, to take other people's advice sometimes when they're telling you you're acting different because we tend to think that we're authorities on our own behavior and our own personalities. But when you know that you have a condition that makes your personality uh, potentially susceptible to these drastic changes, you need to take other people's uh, comments seriously. Now that can be very difficult given the fact that we have a higher likelihood of being in those conditions and when you're in a condition like depression for example you become very irrational, non-responsive to reasoning and so it, it's just a horrible situation to find yourself in. There's probably no right answer because of all the factors involved uh, but I would definitely say if you're concerned about someone reach out to the, the online support groups for suicide uh, the uh, phone numbers you can call, talk to people who do this professionally and get advice on what you can do and what some of the warning signs are. Because you don't want to be caught off guard. Being caught off guard can be very, very uh, taxing and problematic. And so you want to make sure that you know what you're supposed to do to help. Um, now if it's you, of course, being honest with your friends and family is probably the most important thing any of us can do. And you just say, I feel like taking my life. I don't want to live anymore. Uh, and it's a, that's a horrible thing to hear from money. It's a horrible conversation. It's horrible, horrible, but it's honest. And it lets them know where you're at. And that's the most important thing any of us can do with our loved ones is let them know where we're at. Uh, so that's hopefully the last time I have to talk about that since I don't know much about it. Um, let's see, what else we got going on here? 
I guess we're, wow, a whole hour has blown by. It's incredible. Uh, I really thought it was just like 20 minutes. Um, so let's see, some of the things to take, well, I'm, if we wanna do this weekly, I can happily, you know, commit to doing a weekly Facebook Live video uh, just on my Migraine Guy page, which if you're not liking it, you're missing out on good content. So once this is over, search the Migraine Guy and find the page and like it. Also, the headache review page, go and like it. Also, subscribe on YouTube. <laughs> Just, you know, fishing for fans out here. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so let's see. Lindsay was the one, I think. Let me scroll up here. Yeah, Lindsay, you cert... What was your last name? Lindsay Kearney. Why don't we have just like an explosion of friend, re friend request for Lindsay Kearney, and then we can all message her and just say, you're worth... You're worth our time, you're worth our effort, and we want you to get through this. If uh, the 33 people who are in here right now could commit to do that, just friend request Lindsay, and then just send her a positive message or maybe a positive meme. Just let her know that she's not alone, she doesn't have to do this by herself, and she can make it another day with our help. Um, okay, Darcy, you wanna do a weekly one? Uh, I guess I could maybe do like topic, I could get some topics beforehand rather than uh, forcing you all to think on the spur of the moment and give me topics. Uh, something like that would be good. Uh, so make sure to f uh, find the Migraine Guy Facebook page and like it, and I will post upcoming uh, Facebook Lives. Uh, Thursday about this time works really well for me, so uh, we could do it this time or we could move to a weekend time uh, depending on uh, people's schedules. Um, I'm, I'm in grad school and so I tend to have a pretty flexible schedule uh, since I'm done with the coursework portion and I'm just working on uh, teaching a class and my dissertation. Justine, uh, when this video is done, if you roll back a little bit, uh, we did have a brief discussion of Botox, but long story short, research kind of has a 50-50 success rate, uh, but it's also a 50-50 success rate of people who can afford it, and so it tends to be out of the reach of most people. Um, but check out the discussion that we had earlier. Let's all remember to uh, friend request Lindsay, send her a positive message. I will... Um, Make sure to try and get a list of common questions from this discussion, and we can talk about Imitrex next time as well. Uh, basically, all tryptin injections are superior to tablet form uh, because it gets it in your system immediately, um, and the chemical composition of it changes slightly, and so you can get to uh, experience better effects from it. But, uh, I keep getting, I just wanna keep talking, I don't know. Maybe it's just me being selfish. I like the sound of my own voice. Um, okay, so it's it's been an hour. We'll go ahead and call this one off. Make sure to find the Migraine Guy page, like it, and I will do another Facebook Live next week. Uh, and I will send out a notification to the people who like that page um, and let you know what time and what topics. Let's see here. Some of us have an irrational fear of needles. That's very true. Uh, so just close your eyes and stab that needle right into your thigh. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, I, I don't think that I have any sort of reason to do a Facebook Live, but it's been uh, requested of me. And so I want to do what the community requests. I uh, really appreciate everybody who uh, was in this little chat here. Let's see, quick question here. Ann McAllister's asking, what's the difference between pain management and a neurologist? Well, ugh, there's so many differences. I think the, the general feature is that a pain management doctor, pain specialist, is going to be someone who specializes in helping you cope with pain, whereas a neurologist uh, is going to be basically a brain specialist and so their primary function is the brain and how it functions, not how to help pain. Whereas a pain specialist isn't going to be focused on the brain, they're gonna be focused on helping you cope with chronic pain uh, or pain conditions. Uh, but that's just broad strokes, there's a lot of nuance to uh, the distinction. We can talk about that next week, Anne. 
Uh, we can talk about diets, Cindy. There's the so-called migraine diet. There are people who push the keto diet, the, uh, uh, the low-carb, high-fat, high-protein diet. Um, what else? Uh, so there's a lot of diets out there that claim to help migraine sufferers with varying degrees of research supporting them. Uh, and so uh, I guess we can close. Oh, someone wants to talk about magnesium. Someone wants to talk about other things. Uh, magnesium has a, okay, dieting. So if you're going to talk about diet, I'm just going to try to do like one minute quick rapid fire answers here. So if you're going to talk about uh, migraine diets, you need to have done at least a couple months of diet tracking. You need to know if there are any food triggers that you have, any foods that when you ingest correlate to a migraine occurring. Because if you're going to go on a diet that's going to make you eat a lot of that food, you're going to be screwed. So make sure you diet track before you do any sort of migraine diet. Magnesium. Magnesium is great. has a lot of uh, research to support it. Most of the research actually comes from one guy named Dr. Anthony Mauskop. Uh, and some of his research is very interesting. Some of it's uh, slightly controversial. Some of his study titles clearly are meant to be provocative, like all migraine sufferers should be taking magnesium. But when you look at the study that he bases it off of, it was comprised of like 47 participants. And so he's generalizing all migraine sufferers based off of 47 participants. So it's a little... But the research in general shows that many supplements can help. You just have to find a supplement that actually has in it what it says it has in it. Potassium, magnesium, vitamin B12, uh, Q, O, 10, all of them. Uh, they can all be good. So another thing to do, of course, if you're interested in diet tracking would be to try and get some blood work done by uh, a general practitioner even. Um, just because they can tell you if you have certain levels that are higher or lower than they should be, and then you can see if your diet is contributing to that. So there's another thing to take in to consideration. I'm thinking of doing a little uh, blurb on the YouTube channel where it's called The Migraine Minute, where it's just like rapid fire, quick talking points with very little depth to it. It's real superficial, just in order to get a lot of these things out there. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and close this off. I think it's the third time I've stopped or I've said I'm going to stop. We're going to stop, save this good momentum for next week's Facebook Live. Make sure to check the Migraine Guy page out on Facebook. Hit like to get updates. Make sure to check out the Headache Reviews page. Hit like to get updates. If you want to follow me, the Migraine Guy, on other social media platforms, just search the Migraine Guy. I'm talking Twitter. Instagram, YouTube, and I guess that's it. I'm on Snapchat, but I don't use it for the Migraine Guy, so let's not do that. Uh, head over to the YouTube channel, themigraineguy.com, or YouTube slash themigraineguy. Hit subscribe to get alerted about videos that I upload. Um, what else can I say? Head over to theheadachereview.com. If you're brand new to migraines, if you're scared, if you need diet charts, uh, tracking charts, medication tracking charts, uh, migraine tracking charts. You can get a free set of those in a little ebook I put together that'll help you know what your doctor's probably going to do, what the medications are, and what you should be concerned with about them, and how to track those factors. You can get it all for free.